we are studying a wide variety of physical systems and trying to understand how different aspects of math lead to their macroscopic properties. And one of the main things that we study is textiles. So in our lab, we like to think of knitting as a type of coding. This has a couple of different, different sort of ways uh, of thinking about it. Uh, this is called the Dragon of Happiness shawl. I knitted this version of it, but this is the a picture, a close up of the pattern I bought. So I bought this pattern online from uh, a woman called Sharon Winsor, uh, and so it comes with uh, this grid pattern and all sorts of funny little ASCII symbols that are all telling me different things about the topology of each of the stitches. So with very few exceptions, each symbol here is telling me to use my yarn and needles and make a topologically uh, unique stitch with them. And so those stitches, when they're combined together, create uh, this overall knitted object. Um, and one thing about this particular, um, this particular uh, pattern that was really interesting to me is um, there's some stitches here. They, they are little, little equal signs. You probably can't see it because this is quite blurry, but there's sort of a row of equal signs, a row of dots, a row of equal signs, a row of dots. And so these are the, the flames coming out of the head of the dragon. Um, and, and when I made this, I had been knitting for you know a decade or so and had knitted a lot of different um, lace objects and kind of understood the basics of how things go together. And this is the first time I encountered something that was really sort of topologically unique. It wasn't sort of combinations of other things or like twists and modifications and sort of simple variations on it. This was something that was very different, both sort of phenomenologically and, and topologically. And so that got me interested in thinking about um, ways in which uh, uh, knot theory can help us understand these knits. So asking questions like, what even can we knit? Uh, and so that's one of the things that, that we've been studying. So on a maybe a different level of thinking about how knitting is coding, let's go back uh, in time uh, a couple of hundred years. So this is a picture of a jacquard loom, uh, and the jacquard loom was invented somewhere around 1804, 1807, something like that by um, Monsieur Jacquard. Uh, and basically the idea is that weaving, weaving is a fundamentally different technology than knitting, and I'll, I'll tell you how knitting works. But that first weaving is um, made up of threads that go in two different directions. So there's a, a warp thread, so we'll have that go vertically, and then a weft thread, which is going to go horizontally. And what happens is that the, uh, the weft thread, the, the horizontal ones, go in and out of the, the warp thread. So basically, at every uh, point on this fabric, you can define a, an undercrossing or an overcrossing crossing of the uh, warp, uh, sorry, of the weft thread. And so there's basically lots of tr traditional looms that do these in very specific patterns. So every other thread gets lifted up together, then you are able to take your stitch. Or this happens in groups of maybe two lifted up, two lifted down, two lifted up, two down, something like that. And those repeat over and over. But this is the first uh, digital technology that humanity came across. At least I'm going to argue that. You, you may disagree, and historians may also disagree, but I, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, argue this. So what the Jacquard loom did is it basically said, OK, I have a grid. That means that I have an address for every point on my system, and I can address those basically in binary. I can say uh, a 1 is over and a 0 is under, something like that. Um, Although they didn't use ones and zeros because obviously we were way pre-transistor, they used these punch cards. So either a hole in the punch or a solid space in the punch card. And so this uh, was able to take um, 
take this sort of uh, coding type feed in, it ran through an entirely mechanical system and output uh, a textile that was completely programmable. So that's revolutionary to, I guess, the industrial world, but also to computing. So this is something that um, was uh, like a, a preliminary work to things that would go into like Babbage's type um, mechanical computers uh, and were used all the way up through, I guess, the, the um, vacuum tube era computers. And then this only sort of changed once uh, we had transistors and were able to miniaturize and get things like keyboards and, and um, that sort of our modern era of computation. But this is, this is the original thing. And, and in fact, these machines still exist. Uh, they are, they're massive. They would take up the entire floor plan of this room and be about two or three stories tall. And they look like they will rip your arm off. They're uh, quite impressive. And they still uh, make textiles today. So probably in the gift shops around here, if you see a blanket that has has you know the uh, Park City uh, mountainscape or a sunrise, something like that, kind of Im uh, embedded in the fabric itself. Those are going to be made on one of these jacquard looms. Sorry for all of the feedback. Maybe if I stand down here, it'll be better. I don't know. <laughs> Give me a shout if 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 it's bothering you in the back. Um, so. So back to our, our knitting story. So we, we have the ability of encoding symbols. In this case, it's not binary. We have uh, a whole alphabet of different things we can co encode. And the way in which we put them together creates different textiles. And those different textiles have very different mechanical properties to them. Um, so we're going to be talking about coding as a way of going from this sort of ASCII symbol chart here to to over to something that has uh, mechanical properties. So this is our, our knitted stitch uh, here. So basically, uh, the way this works is we've got two needles. We've got a left needle and a right needle. Um, and uh, both of these have a bunch of loops on them. And then hanging off the back of my right needle here, this is called the working yarn. And if I want to make a stitch, basically what I do is I take my right needle, I put it through the first loop on my left needle, then I wrap the working yarn around that needle, and then I pull the, a loop of the working yarn through the loop that's on my left needle and slide it over to my right needle. So the only thing I'm doing here is I'm taking loops and I'm pulling loops through those loops. So this is something that uh, basically is a bunch of slip knots. This is why uh, you can pull at the, the edge of your sweater and it, it can unravel sometimes. But um, and this is, this is our basic stitch. And so what my group is interested in is sort of studying this from a mathematical point of view and a mechanical point of view. So this stitch uh, that I'm showing you here, uh, this is a sort of zoom in of the stitch I did with uh, my needle, although here I uh, put it in periodic boundary conditions, so it's sort of inside um, a torus here. And I've got a copy or a piece of fabric made um, made out of that over here. Uh, it's this this blue one here. I, I'll pass these around so so you'll get a chance to play with them. Uh, and this is this is fabric that is um, says very common. I, this is called to me stockinette because I'm a hand knitter. If you are a sewer or a machine knitter, you'll probably call it jersey. Um, and and this is. This is what t-shirts are made out of. It's what hoodies are made out of, socks, underwear, you name it. If it's a stretchy material that you're wearing, it's probably made out of this underlying structure. And that's interesting because I could take the same yarn and weave it and it would have totally different properties. Uh, but this particular uh, this particular fabric, it's great. It's um, it's quite stretchy horizontally. You can you know pull the neck of your t-shirt over your head. Your head's much, much bigger than your neck. Uh, so that has like a lot of stretch to it. It's not so stretchy in the other direction, but it's got some give to it. 
Uh, so I'm going to pass this around for you all to, to play around with. So the other thing about that fabric, uh, so that's uh, facing this way. If I were to just pick that whole fabric up and rotate it by 180 degrees, so it's facing, I guess, away from you, um, the stitches look like this. Um, and as a knitter, we call those purl stitches. So we've got sort of knit stitches and purl stitches. They're really the same thing. It's just which side of the fabric are you on? And I can combine these in a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, so here I have uh, three more ways. These are the, the most common fabrics that you'll see in sort of knitting patterns. Uh, we have first off is garter stitch, which is alternating rows of knits and pearls. Um, Yeah, basically, you're basically just doing the same thing, but from the back side of the fabric. You don't you don't completely turn it around, no, but you you sort of figure instead of putting your needle. So if I was holding my needles up like this, I took my right needle and put it through the loop here. I sort of twist it around, so I put the needle through the the back side of the same loop. Yes. So does that change just the crossing pins? That's Yeah, that just changes those those local crossings, and it just so switches them. Here, but it's, it's it's both a reflection and a rotation. Um, I guess I, I tend to think of it as a rotation, just because that's a, a physical process I can do. Like I can't really cut a material open, put a mirror up, and continue the, the material across. But from a, from a symmetry point of view, absolutely, it could be either a mirror or, or a rotation. So that is this fabric I have here. This is the, the orange fabric. Um, and this fabric, uh, you will, you'll see right off, it's also a rectangle, but a differently shaped rectangle. So this one's uh, got uh, an aspect ratio such that it is wider than it is tall. Uh, and this is definitely much stretchier uh, in this vertical direction. And it's, it's pretty stretchy in the horizontal direction, pretty, pretty equivalently stretchy. But these are sort of significantly different. If I were to switch the uh, order of these so that instead of being oriented as rows of knits and pearls, I now look at columns of knits and pearls. Instead, I have something that's called rib fabric. Uh, and rib is something that you'll see pretty commonly. This is often what um, cuffs and collars are, are made out of. So this is a very stretchy material. This one, um, you can see here, if I were to stretch it horizontally, it's about an order of magnitude stretchier than that first sample that I passed around. Uh, and that's just by changing which side of the material I'm knitting on. This is just changing a couple of crossings from getting a totally different new material. And then the last one here is, um, is called seed stitch, and this is a checkerboard lattice of these knits and pearls. Uh, and so I have that, that one here. Um, the thing that's a little bit interesting about this is you'll note most of the other ones have very strong uh, anisotropy. So one direction is stiff and the other direction is soft. This one is fairly isotropic. It's about as isotropic as you can get for one of these kind of discretized materials. So we're trying to understand in our group how, how this works. So I'm going to take a little break and think a little bit about uh, symmetry. So, so I think, I guess you, you, you mentioned a little bit there's rotations and, and mirrors, but I guess more formally we can define symmetry as any transformation that takes an object to itself. Um, and so, for example, this pattern here would have a, a rotational symmetry. Uh, so I, I think a fun place to look for, for symmetries is looking at uh, flags of the world. Uh, so here are a bunch of different flags. And, and instead of them having rectangular borders, we're just going to assume that they are infinitely on the 2D plane. Uh, so all of these have some sets of symmetries in common. So, so what do you see? 
What symmetries do you see? So I'm. I, yeah, there's one type of symmetry, one class of symmetry, I should say. So. I heard both reflections and rotations coming from different people. So who wants to make a case for each? Yeah, so Albania has a central reflection here. So does Georgia. Tennessee does. It's just, yeah, it's not, it's like a sideways line. And the other, the other ones all have vertical lines. So, so the other ones, some of them have, have more than one line. Like Switzerland would have uh, a line through the center, maybe line through these diagonals, things like that. So these uh, all have mirrors. And, and we can use these mirrors to define um, sort of fundamental domains for, for these patterns. So I can take uh, one thing, one of these little uh, triangular wedges here. And that's all I need. That plus identifying things as mirrors is, is enough to define the entirety of the pattern. So, so here they are. Here are our fundamental domains. And basically, I take this little pattern here for Tennessee, and I say, OK, well, I've got a mirror here. I've got a mirror here. So I can just take my object and flip it over, print it down, flip it over, print it down, flip it over, print it down. And that is enough to recreate the entirety of, of Tennessee's flag. Um, other ones that are fun, I guess Vietnam is pretty fun, since that's just this little triangle. And somehow that creates a five-pointed star. Uh, which is maybe not obvious at first, but um, you can just use these symmetries to generate the whole pattern. Here's another set. So here we're going to ignore colors and then little bits of the sort of external details, like assume these are all um, solid bars. Someone in the back, what, what, what do you think? Yeah, so these all have rotational symmetry. Um, and uh, we can, I guess, define points about which th those symmetries act. So for instance, uh, Maryland would have a twofold rotational symmetry about the, the central point. Again, this is assuming that the colors don't count. Um, and I guess the ILO or the, the Hong Kong has a, a five-fold symmetry about the center um, of the flower. So each of these, we can define um, a point and then the order of the symmetry there. And from this, we can also define um, fundamental domains. Here I've drawn straight lines in, uh, but they don't have to be straight lines. They just have to be a line that's the, that also respects the, the symmetry. Um, so here, again, all I need is one of these little wedges. Um, and I can use that to define the whole, uh, the whole object. So here, uh, I guess we can start with the Isle of Man. Here we have one leg. Um, and I can cut out this little wedge. Now, instead of uh, acting as a mirror from either of these sides, what I do is I glue this edge over to, to this edge. So I can imagine cutting out this wedge, rolling it up like a cone, and then I can unroll the cone around the symmetry point. So I, I start here, and then I can roll out the thigh, and then the calf, and then the foot over here, and then a thigh, and a calf, and a foot over here. And that would be how I could create all of these, uh, or all three legs of uh, the Isle of Man flag. Yeah, so I'm, ignore, I'm ignoring the, the details of the gaps. And again, we're ignoring, we're, we're always ignoring colors in, in this. But you're absolutely right. The, the details of the gaps here would change it. And also NATO, the, the lengths of the little dashes out here are different. So we're, we're kind of, we're, we're, doing, we're doing our best with uh, what the politicians gave us, um, which is uh, what I can say about a lot of the world. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, could you try to repeat that again? Can you come stand up or something? Maybe. Let me get oh, the mic. That will help. 
sorry, the, the projector has a, a, a left fan on it, so it's a little hard to, to hear. Who was speaking? Oh, uh, right next to you. Hello. Yeah, isn't the shape of the diagonals in the United Kingdom a little weird? Yeah, so those are, I guess, a, a little bit weird, but the, I guess the idea is that this corner should get rotated over to be something like this, although they would be technically uh, on this wedge, not on the bottom, but try, we're, we're, we're again trying to do our best, but that's absolutely true that the, the shape of them is a little bit off-center. So, so now we kind of understand uh, these structures. Uh, what about Martinique? Martinique, we can obviously say it's symmetric, but I don't see any reflections. I don't see any rotations. So what's going on here? Yeah, so this has translational symmetry. Uh, so basically, I can take the snake and copy it over. So it's, it's actually was kind of hard to find a flag that had only translational symmetry uh, without other symmetries to it. Um, but uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of our little snake friend here. So here's uh, how this works. These are movies from um, a software that's called Attractor. Uh, and yes, it is spelled that way. So if you are looking it up, write down that spelling. It's by uh, a Portuguese group. Um, and so this is the, they, what they did is they went through um, a whole bunch of uh, ancient artifacts and looked for all of the 17 wallpaper symmetries and tried to uh, use those as sort of animations to uh, uh, to illustrate uh, what's going on. And, and these shapes you're going to see, these are called um, orbifolds. So this is our fundamental domain. And here I'm going to identify uh, the color-coded edges with one another. So here I have uh, a, an orange edge meeting up with an orange edge, and then the blue edge meeting up with the blue edge. So this is forming uh, our friend, the, the two torus. Um, and what it's going to do is, in order to copy everything out, it's going to unroll everything in the plane and print everything onto the bottom surface. And this is something, this, uh, this pattern is something that I guess is, is a bit familiar because I showed this to you uh, before with our knitting. I, I, I showed you this picture and you, you all knew exactly what I was talking about without having to, to walk through this whole symmetry argument. Um, but what we do uh, to try to understand this as far as not theory is concerned is, in fact, look at uh, sort of symmetries in that way. So in this object, I don't have anything that's topologically a knot. I have a bunch of uh, threads that are just wiggling in space, but they're not entangled. They have ends. This is not uh, a knot. However, when I put it in um, a torus, in this case, it's going to be a thickened torus, um, I do have identifications of this edge with this edge, or sorry, this end of the thread with this end of the thread, this end of the thread with this end of the thread, this end of the thread with this end of the thread. And now I have something that's knotted. It's just not knotted in a manifold we're used to dealing with. It's knotted in a periodic manifold. And so basically, we're interested in studying knots in the, the thickened torus, so T2 cross I. Uh, and we're going to do that here. I'll show you how I might draw this up. So I'm going to take, or how I might join this up, excuse me. So I'm going to extend the, the edges. Then I can take the sides, the top and bottom, and sort of rotate them around behind. Now I'll take the edges and wrap them around behind. And so what I've gotten here, now this, this looks like it's a knot in R3 or a knot in S3. Um, here I have uh, two trefoil knots that are, are joined together. Um, but I wasn't paying attention to my thickened torus. So when I do pay attention to my thickened torus, I now have um, a couple of places where my, my knots are not allowed to be. Um, and so this, this uh, structure here is, is really the thing I want to study. Uh, and so I would say this looks to me like the, the glaze on the surface of the donut. So all textiles live in the glaze on the surface of a donut. Uh, if you would like uh, that to, I don't know, that sounds, uh, I guess I'm hungry or something. Um, 
And so what we can do is try to, to study knots that way. So here I've taken my, my uh, periodic knot, and I'm going to put this in, um, in that manifold and try to keep track of the, uh, I guess, the uh, core of this green loop, and then I guess the, the sort of core of the, the, um, the yellow guy. But in S3, these are the same thing. So, so that makes my life a little easier, but we're, we can ignore those details for now. So here, I'm going to put it in the space. So here's my uh, set of uh, links that are uh, uh, passing through one another. Uh, this is the hop link. And what I want to do is I want to wrap uh, the green side all the way around this uh, green puncture back and join up with the green side over here. I'm going to do the same thing secondarily with the red side. So We'll start with the green sides, uh, and I can glue those together. Uh, I don't have a nice animation for this because I did some of these drawings before I learned how to use the animation tools in the software. Um, so excuse those. Uh, so now I have my hop link again, and I've got my uh, two green sides identified. We're going to do the same thing with the red side. So I'm going to sort of pull them up to just sort of show you I'm wrapping them backwards like I did in the um, uh, other animation. And then I, I can join them up. So now I've got uh, this annulus and, and this annulus. These are my two faces that have now been identified. But now I've got this hop flink along for the ride that's um, properly entangled into to the system. Uh, if I draw a not theory diagram, now I have the thing I started with here. Or, uh, and then uh, basically, I've got some gadget around it. So now I'm, I can think of this in S3. And then I've got this gadget that is keeping track of everything in mapping it into T2 cross I. And I can study these the same way that normal not theorists study them. Yes? Yes. Yeah, it is. Three, the three sphere minus a hop link gives me T2 cross I. So this is sort of just a, a nice way to show, show that step. Uh, so basically, the question now is, what can I put inside this? What counts as, as, as a knot? Um, and so this is a project that was being studied by um, Shashank Markande, who is a PhD student uh, in my lab. And so what he did is he got all of these. He didn't know how to knit when he came into my lab. I think he started grad school the year before I joined as a professor. Um, and so he didn't even know that knitting was a thing that you could study in grad school. So um, I, you know, I asked him to, to learn to knit, and he did. And, and so he was trying to understand, you know, Oh, are there commonalities between these different knitted stitches? Um, and so we gave him these all of these stitch dictionaries. And so he started looking up different uh, knot theory invariants and sort of different properties of them to see if there's anything that was similar. And he noticed that um, everything in those books, when we sort of put them in this S3 picture, that everything had this property that they're ribbon. And I'm not going to define ribbon for you in a formal sense, because that involves four 40 and all sorts of other stuff that's irrelevant to the talk, but for the, yes? So this question, when you say which can be knit, you yes. using those stitches and scratches at the beginning? Uh, so imagine I have loops on my needles and a piece of yarn that's connected to infinity, and I can do anything I want with those. What can I do? So it's, it's not just the combinatorics of how do I combine knits and pearls. It's I'm given uh, a bunch of loops and uh, two, needles. two needles, a bit of string that's connected uh, that, that I don't have access to the end of. Uh, what can I do? Um, and so, so he noticed that these are all ribbon. And I, I'll just give you the, the colloquial definition of ribbon for now is that um, basically if you were to take your, your knot and um, 
put a, a disk on it such that the knot is the boundary of the disk, the disk can only self-intersect in very specific ways. So it can either have two sort of disjoint regions or it can pass entirely through one of the other disks. You can't have a place where part of it's passing through another part of it. So you can't have these sort of X-shaped pieces. Um, and so he, he was able to, to look at this and he was sitting around thinking, OK, well, like maybe uh, maybe this is, this is the commonality. So maybe all knitted stitches have to be ribbon knots. Um, that maybe, what about, what about the converse? Uh, every ribbon knot, can, can I knit that? And so he was sort of juggling these ideas for a while. And so, so one day he sent me this picture. So he sent me, this is a ribbon knot, but he, didn't, he was not sure if this could be knitted. So like, is this a counterexample to all ribbon knots being knittable? Um, and so, you know, I, he's like, oh, how, how can we knit this? I was like, well, bring some, bring some yarn and needles on Monday and, and we'll figure it out. So uh, in fact, uh, this was knittable. And so here are six of the stitches he had. So, so this grad student who started grad school knowing nothing about knitting was able to use math to invent an entirely new knitted stitch just using math. Uh, and so I think that's just phenomenal. I think that's really the power of taking math and applying it to all of these areas outside of pure math that, that may benefit from some of these insights. Um, and in fact, uh, we were able to prove the theorem that uh, all knittable stitches must be ribbon knots, uh, and we can disprove the converse. So all ribbon knots do not always uh, correspond to knitted stitches. Uh, I guess, I mean, I probably could. It's a little bit hard to show how, like, I have to go through the formal definition of what a knit is and then show that there's ribbon knots that are not made by doing that. So I, I will probably not do that in this talk, but yes. Uh, so uh, it went through a bunch of different names for a while, but I think we've settled on cow hitch stitch because it looks like the cow hitch knot. Um, but that's, uh, you know, that was that took like about two years to settle down to a specific name. Um, so uh, in, a, in a longer discussion, I, I could show you that, but that seemed a little bit technical and not theory-ish for a, a fun cross-program talk. Um, so, so this is so that that's one uh, thread of this talk. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about different uh, different projects, and I guess I'll try to do that in the next uh, about 15 minutes. Uh, so here, this is a project. This is joint work with Henry Segerman and Fabienne Serrier. Um, and so Fabienne uh, had run a Kickstarter to buy an industrial knitting machine so that she could make these uh, generative scarves, and she had this like amazing, um, well, just these absolutely amazing textile pieces that she would make for people. Um, and often they were based on, um, on cellular autonoma, automina, um, which are, which looks like what you can see here. And if you don't know what those are, uh, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll show you in, in just a second. Um, and these are made um, using a process called double-sided knitting. And so double-sided knitting is basically you have fabric on the front that's one color and fabric on the back that's the other color. So if I were to look at the front of it and I have uh, a blue sun and a white background, the back of it is going to be uh, a white sun and a blue background. Um, maybe I should have said that the other way because a white sun makes more sense in a blue background than the other way around. Um, so, so basically these have a new symmetry to them. So when you look at go from the front to back, you're now taking the inverse of the colors. So why does this work with cellular automata? So the idea of a cellular autonoma, automata, gosh, I can't talk today, is you have um, these sort of binary patterns. And, and so we'll look at, at this, these two pieces on the top here. So you have, um, you've got some arbitrary binary string and you look for groups of three. So if the three is zero, 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 the 
next one in the center below will, in this case, be a one. And if you have zero, zero, one, then you'll have a zero below it. So it's basically you have a string, and then you just apply a set of rules to it by looking at uh, the tile. three tiles. You fill in the, the center one below. Uh, and so we were looking for ones that had this, we called it a scarf symmetry, where you've got a binary pattern, but when you reverse it uh, and take its inverse, you get the same thing back. So, so the, the, I guess the, the story behind this is that uh, Fabian had been doing this, and she had posted some patterns and on Twitter back when Twitter was less toxic. Um, the, someone asked the question, well, what happens if this is on a Mobius strip? And so we sat down. And we're like, okay, what happens if we code this? So we, we sort of coded it up a little thing. And well, we got these, these sort of simple, small patterns like this that came out. But that's not very satisfying. That's not really a scarf. So we started looking for things that are approximately scarf size. So maybe 100 stitches wide and 1,000 stitches long. Um, and so we were able to find two of them. Um, and so here's what I guess the two of them look like. Uh, it turns out that these two patterns are sort of, I guess, inverses of one another. So they have every time like black, 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 or zero, zero, zero causes a zero in one, it's going to cause a one in the other. So there's there's a, an inverse relationship. So it's really the same pattern, just uh, with uh, every other row being uh, reversed. Uh, so. Let's have a look at um, some more of these symmetries. So I, we talked about reflections and rotations before. Uh, so here, uh, here's a, a wallpaper pattern, and this is this is made up of only reflections. Uh, so we've got, I guess, uh, reflection down here, reflection through here, reflection through here, reflection through here. So there's four mirrors that pass through this point, four mirrors that pass through this point, and then two mirrors that pass through this point. So that's going to define a small triangle of our fundamental domain. And so this is how the software attractor can tile this out. So here we, we start with, with our triangle with uh, mirrors on every edge. Um, and so I can pick this triangle up and then start uh, unwrapping that in the plane. And so we can use this to generate uh, this entire um, piece of, of wallpaper with, uh, with this particular group. If I were to draw anything else in there, I would generate a new wallpaper, but with the same group. Um, in the case I have all uh, rotations, I get this. So I have uh, a six-fold rotation here, three-fold rotation here, and then there's a sneaky two-fold rotation right here that takes this star into to this star. Uh, and so this is what my domain looks like. Um, and again, the colors of the edges are telling uh, me about what's identified. So I'm going to roll these up. But now the front and back of this thing don't match. So they're going to puff it out. So this is a little samosa. Um, and so the samosa is going to roll around each of the uh, points. It has the, the correct number of times in order to unwrap the, the entirety of this rotational symmetric pattern. Um, and so this is this is how we define that. And there's a, a fun fact about these things. So you can list um, some different orbifolds and then use Euler characteristic to uh, prove that there are only 17 wallpaper groups. So that's a, a fun exercise uh, for those of you out there. So what about this picture? There's something a little bit weird going on here. Um, so if I if I look at this pattern down here, this looks this is great. This is uh, we can uh, use all of the tools we've built to understand what's going on. So we've got I guess a mirror down through the center here. We've got a mirror passing through here. So there's I guess two mirrors at this point, two mirrors at this point, and then over here there's a two-fold rotation that takes this into this. So that's that's enough to define what our, our orbifold is. Uh, and we're happy with that. But then we get up to the top of the dress. And now something's wrong. So I still have my mirror symmetry down the front. But I've lost my mirror symmetries 
uh, away from it. Um, so all of my horizontal mirror symmetries are gone. Any rotational symmetry, if I rotate about this point, locally it's okay, but globally it's not. So, so what's going on here? So what's going on here is that this now has curvature. So normally everything we talked about was in the, the 2D plane. So this is 2D flat space. Uh, but uh, the, the dress is actually 2D curved space. This, is, this dress has to fit on a person, and we are all curved. Um, and that's something about pattern making that's really hard. So, so how many people here have tried like sewing, knitting, making a garment? OK, so I see, I see maybe a quarter to a third of you. I think a quarter proud people, and the other few are like, the other sixth are you know, being a little shy out there. But you know, be proud. You have made clothes. This is a, uh, a good strategy for the zombie apocalypse. You, know, you can uh, help, help, uh, help reconstruct civilization um, by making your own clothing. Um, uh, so, so how do you sew a shirt? Um, it is obviously uh, summer, so I don't see very many people wearing uh, dress shirts or button-down shirts here. Uh, most most people have. Oh, yeah, I guess you've got you've got a a bit of a button-down shirt. Okay, so that is a button down. So button down shirts um, are are actually incredibly complicated. Well, I mean, we think of the standard T-shirt. We've got you know a front and a back, a couple of sleeves. Take two of them, slap them together, add some seams. You're done. No, 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 no. So if you actually look at the pattern that makes up uh, a dress shirt or a, a button down shirt, you get something like this. Um, and one thing you're going to notice is that. All of these, um, all of these shapes. There's almost no straight lines on the entire thing. There's a couple places where there are straight lines. Uh, like this is a lovely straight line right here, and this is fold. So that is telling us that we have some symmetry there. And this is bilateral symmetry because humans have, you know, a, a left hand side that's approximately the same as our right hand side. So we can take advantage of that symmetry. Uh, maybe the bottom here is straight because we don't really care about what the how how it ends up because we're all tucking it into to shirts or, or into our pants primarily or at least that's how they're you know intended in these sort of fancy uh, fancy pants uh, types of um, uh, garments but pretty much everything else you have little curves you've got big curves you've got symmetric curves you've got ones that have a little zigzaggy thing here you've got all sorts of different shapes here and so these are there to accommodate the curvature of a human oh wow I am really running out of time uh, so I was I'll just walk you briefly through how um, how we might do this uh, so there's we can sort of distill these down into a couple of different ideas and so one of them is um, creating what are called darts so darts are when you take uh, your piece of fabric you fold it in half you sew a diagonal line through it um, and that's how you make a cone so you sort of pop it back inside out and you've got uh, a conical point here uh, and so these are used in lots of places uh, they're used often at at busts or around your sort of hips and butt uh, places where where I guess we think of as being curved there's also things that you can do uh, basically that are like almost an anti-dart. These are called godets. You take a wedge of fabric and you put it into a seam. And so this creates a different kind of curvature. So here, this is something that would happen around uh, sort of a saddle point. So you could look at this as, a, as something you would do at, at the waist of um, a, a garment or if you want like a fancy mermaid skirt with a lot of floof around the bottom this is a way of doing that so these are basically the two things that these are the two most sort of fundamental ideas behind uh, how you would add curvature to a sewing piece uh, and there's a lot of ways you can combine them together but let's sort of analyze them in more detail so here I have some fabric that has a six fold symmetry um, and so I take a, a wedge out of that fabric uh, at one of those symmetry points um, 
And now I'm going to glue this edge of fabric to this one over here. And so I get this cone. So this, I would say this is a point of, we're going to call this positive curvature, positive Gaussian curvature. Um, and you can see there is now one pentagon in the center. And then everything else outside that is a perfect hexagon. Um, and this makes a really nice cone. So this is so sort of an analysis of one of our darts. And here we've taken away, I guess, 60 degrees of area. So a flat thing would have 360. Um, a positively curved thing has less than 360 or less than 2 pi. Uh, and a negatively curved thing, as uh, you could probably guess, is going to have more than 2 pi. So now I take this wedge and I put it back into the same symmetry center, uh, and I end up with this structure here. So here I have, um, instead of a hexagon or a pentagon, I have a heptagon, so something that has seven sides. Um, and then everywhere else I have hexagons. And now instead of this um, being a cone, now this is sort of a point about which everything ruffles. So this is something, again, you can't lay flat in the plane, um, but this is, this is sort of a saddle type structure locally about this point. And so here we have, um, I guess, more than two pi, so we have positive Gaussian curve at this point. Yes? No, not in this case. Not, not. Right now, we're, we're looking at little flat pieces. And that's typically how things are designed in like the sort of fashion world. You basically start with um, what, what's called a block. So you start with something that is not stretchable and fits your body as closely as possible. And then you can start like manipulating these singular points and doing interesting things to them from there to add the sort of fashion onto the fit. Uh, so here, this is a dress. This is made by Andrea Shuey, who's a, a clothing designer, a costume designer, and Robin Sillinger, who's a physics professor. Um, and they wanted a way of doing a sort of reconfigurable dress that fits multiple sizes of person. So they did it using regular pentagons, hexagons, and heptagons. Um, and you can see that the, the pentagons ended up near the, the bust of, of, I guess, this dress form and the um, heptagons are around the waist, and then I guess one in between the bust. And so those are there to give uh, both positive and negative curvature to this. Uh, this is another project. This is a uh, joint work with uh, Lewis Campbell when he was an undergrad and Kelly Delp. Uh, and here the idea was how do we not look at these uh, these uh, curve points as sort of singular points, but how do we, can we stretch all of that curvature along a line? Uh, and so we did that looking at some scarves. So here, imagine you have this puzzle piece and you continue to tile it out, you can get a nice scarf. Uh, but it, what if you wanted to add some negative curvature to it, for example? So if you look really closely in at one of these boundaries, uh, on the, the left-hand side, we've got an angle of alpha. The right-hand side, we've got an angle of beta. Those two, when it's flat, add up to, to 360 degrees. But if we increase one by just a teensy little bit, we've got a little bit of positive, uh, sorry, negative curvature here. So what we can do is we can do that by integrating along the curve by adding just a teensy bit of angle to it. And so here, I'm going to take minus 60 degrees away from this and plus 60 degrees and add it to this curve. And this is how they're going to bend. Um, and as these bend, um, one thing to point out is that the arc length of these isn't changing. We're merely sort of bending the shape of them. And so now I've got these two very different looking pieces, but they have the same arc length. So we could, in fact, sew them together. Uh, and, and that is, in fact, what Lewis did. But first, he's going to make some pieces that make a little bit more sense than just pointing off into random directions. So here, he's aligned the, the start and end points as uh, aligned vertically for both of them and made a, a scarf piece from them. Uh, and so he, he sewed them together. Um, 
and created some scarves. So this is uh, a scarf based on this uh, particular piece here. And then he decided, well, let's let's sort of change the, the angle. So I arbitrarily fixed those two start and end points so that they're vertical. What if I relax that and let them be at different angles with respect to one another? Uh, and he came up with a different piece, which is here, and made that. And you'll notice that this one fits the, the neck of the mannequin way better than the other one. And, and that's because, I guess, we have a like variable curvature along our necks. So uh, basically shifting those is basically changing how the, the boundaries are behaving. Uh, and that gives us a different chunk of, of hyperbolic space that can wrap more, more uniformly around our body. I am basically out of time. I'm going to, to stop there. Um, I have many more stories about this, including how uh, human intestines are like a wedding dress. So uh, if you are interested in that story, uh, come ask me uh, sometime throughout the remainder of the program. Thank you so much. <laughs>